Well, good morning. It's Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV. And um, of course, uh, uh, of course, Insegna Booksellers. Uh, I've been, I've come a little bit later today because um, the icons on the, on the screen <laughs> have changed. But anyway, look, this is the history. It's a history uh, presentation, lesson number 22. And we're doing the Paleolithic uh, age uh, we're doing the Paleolithic age, and uh, specifically, uh, and specifically Africa. Now I need someone to come on because uh, I'm not sure whether I'm on or not. Uh, I think I am, but anyway, we'll see what happens. Uh, somebody has to come on. I'm live, they say, but um, yeah, uh, the the actual live stream is on. Uh, but I'm not quite sure, so uh, let's hope that everything is okay. Otherwise, I'll have to, you know, do it um, again, I suppose. Uh, come on, somebody, come on. <laughs> uh, today, I want to do African archaeology and um, look at the, at, at the continent of Africa in terms of world history and the importance that it has had. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, we don't give it enough importance, but it is one of the earliest um, places where humans began their, their life, uh, their lifestyle uh, from the very, very early Paleolithic age, even before Homo erectus, I mean, is, is, there's a, quite a lot of, um, of information about it, uh, really, uh, but we, do we talk about it that far? But anyway, that, that's one of the th ones that I'm going to do. And the second one, uh, I'm going to, of course, continue with before the invasion. Uh, yes. And uh, also uh, from Banjo Patterson, but I'm not coming on. I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going on here, whether I am on or not. I'm not sure. Uh, so what do I do here? Do I start again? Uh, what do I do? Come on, friends. Come on. Somebody come on. Yes, no, maybe. Uh, oh, well. That's no good, is it? Um... Look, um, I'm assuming that uh, it's okay, so I'm going to keep going and see what happens. See what happens. Yep. Uh, and after that, I want to try a few more things. Uh, I'll do some songs. Uh, today, I've left it a little bit late. But anyway, it's 11.30 now, and uh, here I am with um, the African archaeology part. Okay. So here we go. Africa. Uh, now, some of this information, of course, is from uh, is from um, you know online uh, because it's got everything. Uh, you know, you got to Doctor Google and uh, you know uh, uh, Chrome, whatever, and you can pick up a lot on. African archaeology and also the content of the early Stone Age, the Middle Stone Age, the later Stone Age, and then there are the other parts. So let's have a look at um, some of the, some what they say. Africa has the longest record of human habitation in the world. The first hominins emerged six, seven million years ago, and among the earliest anatomically modern humans, skulls found so far were discovered in Africa. So the, the earliest um, uh, the earliest skulls of of, of men uh, of well humans as they developed were found in Africa. So the, 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 where uh, how did they divide now? They're saying that six seven million years ago we were talking about forty fifty sixty two hundred thousand. Here we're talking about six seven million years ago when uh, when some of these skulls were. Uh, have been dated. So African archaeology really is 
very, very old. And it's generally divided into early Stone Age, Middle Stone Age, and later Stone Age. So the early part, uh, the early part is um, uh, is interesting, because even before uh, Homo erectus arrived on the scene, there were some uh, tools that have been made uh, in the early part. So the early Stone Age, which spanned from approximately 2.6 million years ago to 280 years ago, uh, 280,000 years ago. So that's a very big part. It's 2 million. Uh, in African prehistory in which the first stone tools were developed. So the first, and where, did, where they found, they were found in, in Kenya, uh, in Ethiopia, in Tanzania. So uh, that uh, western part of Africa. Uh, so that's where the, they are. And the first, uh, f you know, a lot of fossils, one of the, one of the first uh, fossils was called Australopithecus. In other words, it's almost like Australian, uh, you know, Austra like Australian. Australopithecus is one of the first uh, humans found, human uh, s skeletons. And, uh, well, that's in, in, uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, we've got to look in, into those. So the earliest relative dating for stone tools used was discovered in 2015. So it's only very recent that they've discovered it. And uh, the oldest stone tools were found, and they're talking about the, the actual places where the, they are found. But around a million years later, Homo erectus evolved in a more advanced species and made tools known made tools. They made specifically some hand axes. So the, the, the hand axes, look, I'm not quite sure whether I am live or not. No one is coming on. Normally uh, people come on and uh, I, I don't know what's happening today. Uh, I really don't know what's happening today and I don't want to stop it because I know that um, uh, it, it, it says here on the screen, uh, you know, it, it points to finish, so, and it says that I'm live right now. So even people don't come on, I'm sorry. Uh, the, usual, uh, the usual way of doing this uh, particular uh, presentation uh, is not in my hands uh, today. I'm a bit nervous about it. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I will keep going. Okay, so uh, we're talking about a million years ago, so the, the, these Homo erectus, so when men and women, of course, uh, lifted their, their hands up. So they, they actually stood straight, vertical. And we've seen from my other previous um, presentations that uh, once that happens, then uh, the human brain, for some reason, uh, tends to develop a lot better. Uh, and that's what happened at the time. Now, the problem with all this is that we don't know what, what comes first. You know, what, what, why does our brain, uh, why has our brain developed in the way that it has? Is it because, uh, you know, people uh, were able to lift their, their front paws? Well, I don't know. And, and this is a, a very interesting part. Now let's have a look at the now Middle Stone Age Africa. The Middle Stone Age Africa, dating to roughly 280,000 to 40,000 years ago, is characterised by the continuation of hunter-gatherer lifestyles and some more recently recognised perhaps the origins of modern human behaviour and cognition, in other words, the use of the brain uh, and the development of the brain. Even though hominin species brains were reorganised and modernised at a fast rate, the behaviour of these hominins did not adapt quite as fast. So even though they had a, a better brain, but the, their behaviour didn't change. This caused the hominin species to be quite primitive. 
So what do you mean by primitive? It means that you're chasing animals, you're gathering food, etc. African hunter-gatherers hunted larger mammals and relied on an assortment of edible plants. So that's what happened down in Africa, uh, East Central. Both in the grasslands that are near the Sahara Desert and the rainforests of Central Africa, Coastal peoples also subsisted on seafood. Their numerous uh, middens indicated their diets. So, uh, you know, people have been able, the archaeologists have been able to identify some of what people were eating at the time. Uh, it's an interesting thing. So, Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens appear for the first time in the archaeological record around 300 to 270,000 years ago. So we're coming more towards the, the ages that we've discovered, what we talked about in my other presentations in terms of the earliest, uh, the earliest recorded um, well, history. But it's recorded, not in writing necessarily. It's through all the other scientific um, uh, means available to archaeologists. They soon developed a more advanced method of flint tool manufacture involving striking flakes from a prepared core, whatever that means. This permitted more control over the size and shape of finished tool and led to the development of composite tools, projectile points and scrapers, which could be hafted onto spears, arrows or handles. So whatever's happened in other parts, including Australia, that's what's happening there in Africa way before. And we know that from, the, you know, from Africa, the first people, first Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, moved to other parts of the world, including Europe and Asia. And then from there, then to... Uh, to the Americas and uh, and Australia too by going further south. So, you know, Africa is an important... Maybe we should start the study of history uh, with uh, a good look at Africa from the early times because it gives us a clue about what happens in the rest of the world. And why, be, you know, way before the Ice Age melted. The Ice Age came about and then it melted, you know, it, the changes that occurred that led us to our current civilizations. In turn, this technology permitted more efficient hunting such as that demonstrated by a tearing industry. Well, for example, in Eastern Africa, stone tools were made from raw materials such as quartz, tough, and obsidian using the prepared core method. In other words, they used hard stones, which varied by region. And uh, uh, basically these improvements kept on coming and the skills developed further and further. Although still hunter-gatherers, there is evidence that these early humans also actively managed food resources as well as uh, simple harvesting them. The Congo Basin was first occupied around this time. Different conditions and diet, they have produced recognisable different behaviours and tool types. No one has come on yet, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that something is really quite wrong today, but I'm going to keep going till 12.30 and then I'll check and if it's done, then people can listen to what I've said afterwards rather than uh, being with me uh, during the course of my presentation. Because it's live, so presumably that uh, you are seeing it, uh, whoever's come on so far. Okay. Uh, there are also the earliest signs of art appearing through the use of ochre and, and uh, as a body decoration and paint. And burial rituals may have been practised as well. So all the, all the, the types of developments that we mentioned in other parts of the world, all at once now, I find that it's, it's in Africa that's really the womb of the world. The beginnings, the really beginnings, not the, the real beginnings, of course, is over the whole of the planet. 
but in terms of human, uh, our human ancestors uh, predating Homo erectus uh, were in Africa originally. Evidence of a variety be, of a variety of behaviours indi indicative of behavioural modernity date to the African Middle Stone Age, associated with early Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens sapiens means what does it mean? It means uh, wisdom, knowledge. So. Abstract imagery, widened subsistence strategies and other modern behaviours have been discovered from that period in Africa, especially South, North and East Africa. So this is before Egypt, way before. Uh, so in South Africa, for example, there are rectangular slabs of ochre engraved with geometric designs. So, you know, you have to look into where the actual places are, and you can look that up. Yeah, so using multiple dating techniques, the site was confirmed to around 77,000, 100,000 to 75,000 years ago. Also, ostrich, ostrich egg shells containers engraved with the geometric designs dating 60,000 years ago. And we talk about uh, our indigenous people be, have been, been in Australia for 60,000 years here, it's a lot earlier, a lot earlier. Beads and other personal ornamentation have been found from Morocco, which might be as much as 130,000 years ago, as well as caves in South Africa. So, and a number of beads dating from significantly prior to 50,000 years ago. So the ornaments that people wore, uh, the paintings, you know, the artistic part, they've sort of been left behind and we're able to, you know, with the current methodologies of um, looking back in time through technology, you know, we can have a pretty good idea what was going on. So these types of ornamentations represent some of the earliest signs of symbolic behaviour among human ancestors, including developments in cognition and social relations. The beads from another cave in Morocco are thought to be over 142,000 years old. Shell dating to about shell beads dating to about 75,000 years have also been found in South Africa. So, all at once now we see that Africa is giving us a lot, has given us a lot. Now, why is it uh, that somehow? I'm not quite sure, I don't want to, somehow, uh, Africa is not in the forefront of uh, modernity. Or is it there that we discover the true roots of humanity, where people live, uh, have lived in Neolithic time uh, ways for a very long time, They've, you know, with agriculture, pastoral uh, work, you know, it's sort of survival, subsistence. But there are also some industries created, I'm sure. So we'll, get, we'll have a look now. Now, specialised projectile weapons as well have been found at various sites in Middle Stone Age Africa, including bone and stone arrowheads at South African uh, sites and also in Central Africa and also... Uh, lot of javelin throwing in Ethiopia, etc. It's all relating to 300,000 years to 50,000 years. That's the, this middle area. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot that was developed there. Now, in 2008, somebody uncovered uh, something uh, relating to 100,000 years ago. So the discoveries in Africa continue. People do know about African, uh, the origins uh, of humans coming from Africa. So there's great interest in, uh, in the archaeological uh, community for what is going on in Africa. And no wonder that we started our 
my study, literally, after the initial uh, few lessons, well, I went to Egypt. So Egypt being one of the oldest, uh, the oldest uh, civilization uh, developed in the north part of Africa. But we don't hear much about, you know, the south, apart from Egypt, over the centuries. We know that they provided uh, human fodder, if you like, slaves, people. I don't know what's happened there, why it was so. But let's have a look. Expanding subsistence strategies beyond the big game hunting and the consequential diversity in tool types has been noted as signs of behavioural modern modernity. A number of South African sites have shown an early reliance on aquatic resources from fish to shellfish. So they used, you know, the sea as well and the rivers and the lakes uh, to, to get food, of course. So marine resources uh, were used as early as 120,000 years ago, and I would suspect even before. Uh, so more sites in Sudan... Uh, more sites relating to you know this um, the, the, this type of uh, developments. You know, humans in North Africa are known to have dabbled in chert mining as early as hundred thousand years ago for the construction of stone tools. So they actually, you know, when mining uh, uh, stone. Evidence was found in 2018, that's just recently, dating to about 320,000 years ago at, in Kenya for the use of uh, obsidian. I'm, I'm, I suppose it's one of the stones, hard stones. Uh, the use of pigments for projectiles. And there's more coming here. Uh, so what happens here? Modern behaviours began in Africa around the time of the emergence of Homo sapiens. So 300,000 years ago, a million years ago. Who knows? That's as far back as we go into uh, the study of Africa in the Paleolithic Age, the Old Stone Age, the New Stone, the Middle Stone Age, and and the New Stone Age. In twenty nineteen, further evidence of early complex projectile weapons in Africa was found in Ethiopia, dating back eighty thousand to hundred thousand years. So from darts, then they created um, spears. Now later Stone Age. Let's have a look at this. In South Africa, an analysis of, of the cranium of, of a, uh, you know, of a skeleton, a skull, gave us a bit of some clues to, gave a lot of clues to some of the, the scientists. African hunter-gatherer societies developed the microlithic, microlith technologies. Composite microlith tools were useful for harvesting wild grasses and also permitted the produ production of fine shell and bone fish hooks, which may have allowed for the exploitation of a broader range of food resources. Some of the earliest pottery in Africa was, has also been found in the Sahara and is associated with hunter-gatherer populations. By around 10,000 years uh, in Mali, pottery is thought to be independently invented by local hunter-gatherers. So there you are, you know, Mali. As they became more sedentary and began to intensively gather local wild grains such as millet. So the minute that they moved from being hunter-gatherers to the agricultural type, you know, living in small in a small communities, they actually became... Uh, less resilient to, to hardships because, you know, you, uh, 
the hand of Gedrus was always on the move. So from a health point of view, the Neolithic people, we, uh, and that has an effect on us. So in other words, if we take it from the past and we say, what's the best way to keep ourselves uh, in good health and alive? We have to emulate the Paleolithic people. In other words, you've got to be a bit nomadic in your <laughs> in our ways. You can't always stay home. You've got to get out, get into the park, go for long walks, uh, you know, and also use the sea, go to the beach and rivers. So in other words, exercising, movement, very important. But when you do that, you're sort of looking after your body primarily. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's where where we're at at the moment. I just got a a note here on uh, whilst I'm doing this live show, and I hope that it'll work. I'm not quite sure. No one has come on today, so in other words, whatever I've done, I haven't been able to bring people on today, which is a pity because I've done it every time up to now, but I left it a little bit late. I apologise to those people who've come on, but I'm sure that this works because it says that I am on live. Now, let's have a look. That was the latest Stone Age Africa. Now, pastoral Neolithic and Neolithic Africa. Pastoral. Interesting. Domesticated animals. Cultural developments during the early Neolithic led the nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyles to be slowly supplanted by pastoralism in northern Africa. Africa's earliest evidence for domesticated animals comes from the Sahara uh, 7,000, 6,000 years ago, before the birth of Christ. And evidence for new cattle herding lifestyles are preserved at both archaeological sites uh, and in Saharan rock art. As the Sahara increased in size due to aridification, so in other words, the Sahara, once upon a time, were like the steppes, a lot of grass. And then, uh, obviously, as the earth became more hot, then the, you know, the Sahara was formed. So early pastoralists migrated south and eastward into the Niger and Nile valleys. So they, they went close to the rivers, to the big rivers, bringing with them herding practices that would also spread throughout eastern and southern Africa. So the past, pastoralism developed in Africa, in the rest of Africa, uh, as a result of domestica domesticating the herds, uh, cows, whatever, whatever, animals, uh, buffaloes, depending on, on the geography. Uh, in the Western uh, right, settled communities, oh, Francesca Gull is watching. Thank you very much. I thought no one was coming on today because I wasn't on. Well, I thank you very much, Francesca, for coming on, for making me relax a bit, because I thought, no, there's nobody here today. How come? <laughs> no one is interested in Africa. Well, I can tell you, Africa is the, the most interesting of continents in terms of um, the, the, the early history of men, from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens and, and to the Stone Age people, the later Stone Age people and Neolithic people, and in fact, uh, way before Egypt uh, came about. So there you are. Well, thank you, Francis. I really appreciate that. Okay, archaeology points to sizable urban populations in Western Africa into beginning the second millennium before Christ. So that's all right. That's uh, we've done that. Now, trade relations developed before the trans-Saharan trade in response to the opportunities afforded by Northwest diversity and ecosystem across deserts, grasslands and forests. So in other words, if you don't have something, 
you can get it from another community, then there's trade. And with trade, of course, uh, there's um, cooperation amongst humans. So th th it's not always fight. You know, the, the civili civilization really begins when people stop fighting. True civilization is cooperation. Because true civilization, if you don't have something somewhere, you can get it from somewhere else easily. But if you're fighting all the time, then you have to, you know, you have to create it yourself. So in other words, it slows progress down. So in, uh, in our world, uh, this thing that's ha what's happening now in Ukraine and with Russia and, uh, you know, the West, etc., no good for trade, no good at all. It's not good for all people involved, neither for Russia, nor for Ukraine, nor for Europe, Eastern Europe, nor for the rest of the world. Everything will be slower. We can't get what we want if we don't produce it ourselves. Maybe it teaches us a lesson not to be too ambitious, not to be too uh, wide. I've always believed that, that uh, you know, uh, we should be global. But then, you know, over, over the last 20 years, you know, the, the rumblings, uh, for example, with multiculturalism 50 years ago, uh, I thought, you know, maybe what's this? And now you get the same sort of story uh, with the peace movement, etc. Uh, why? We need, we need to cooperate in order to live better. We need to be able to travel across the world. We need Australia to be one so that we can move with aeroplanes, etc. And it's happening now, but we've had a couple of tough years where a bit of thinking is involved. But then health is number one. When you're dead, I mean, everything else doesn't matter. And, you know, this kind of wisdom, I'm not sure how it works with everyone because not everyone is at the same level of understanding. Cognitive development, I call it. So if you don't have it, uh, you can't understand what another person is saying in terms of the importance of peace. Yeah, but that person did, did this, that to me. They stopped doing this and I need more land and I need one more money and I want this and I want that. And why can't I get it? Why does the other person have it and not me? Now, those are the sort of, you know, envy, jealousy that come into play. They're the negatives. But without those negatives, we don't understand or can appreciate the positives. We can take them for granted. So we need, we need to know about both, but the choice, there's no choice. The choice is for us to live in peace. Now, at 12 o'clock, I've talked, you know, I've had a few problems today in terms of, um, well, in terms of uh, this uh, business of uh, the technology here, because I feeling a little bit, uh, you know, <laughs> irritated with myself, but that's the way it is. That's the way it is sometimes. So metal use in Africa. So in Africa, what happened was with this farming community throughout sub-Saharan Africa, interaction between hunter-gatherer, pastoralists and incoming farming communities remains an important topic of interest in African archaeology today. So the relationships that developed uh, all along the big rivers of Africa, the, you know, the archaeological sites, for example, in, certain, in, in central Nigeria, West Africa, around 1500 before Christ, culture developed uh, on the Plateau on the Joss Plateau. The Nok people produced lifelike representations in terracotta, including human heads and human figures, elephants and other animals. By 500 before Christ, and possibly a few centuries earlier, they were smelting iron. By 200 AD, the Nok culture had vanished. 
based on stylistic similarities with the Noc Terracottas, the bronze figurines of the Yoruka, Yoruba kingdom of life of Haif and those of the Bini kingdom of Benin are now believed to be continuation of the traditions of the earlier Noc culture. Now, the, all these names are new to me. They're different tribes. You know, it's like you have to really study this in, uh, in detail. So that's where we are for this week. I'll continue with Africa next week. And um, it looks as if, uh, you know, this is uh, lesson 22. It looks as if I can go on uh, till lesson 25 as, uh, you know, we, with, with my Italian uh, lessons, uh, after lesson 20, I'll go in the sort of pratica battela grammatica, the practice of it. Here, in this uh, particular part of the world history series, once I get to lesson 25, then I'll go, I'll go to lesson 26 onwards. I'll continue, but in a different way. I'll look at the world again uh, from, the bron from the Iron Age. We leave the Bronze Age, we go to the Hittites, we continue, and we, we, we sort of look at uh, around 1,500 years before Christ to about when Christ was born, the beginning of the Roman Empire. And we look at all the cultures within, that developed in that you know, time frame of uh, 1,500 years. And then, of course, the history continues. The more people develop and become civilised, the more civilization there are, the more complex the historical, uh, the historical parts becomes because that's why people then got to their own, uh, their own nations because it's too much, uh, you know, other people's problems in faraway lands. And are they our problems? Uh, you have to be uh, involved in a, a government sense to be interested. Otherwise, we live in our own bubble, basically. And that's important to know how to live well in our bubble. But let's not forget there is a bubble, that there are other bubbles out there. And we want to discover, uh, you know, what, do they, what they do as well. You want to be part of humanity. And you might say, why? Why is this? Because that's how we got here, by being interested in, in outside of our own bubbles. Okay, so that's, um, that's it on Africa for today. I'll continue next time. I'll be better prepared. I had a few people come on right at the beginning to check up on me at 11.25 so that I get somebody who can tell me whether they're on or not. Thank you, Francis. I don't see anyone else, but anyway, we'll see what happens. Um, now, we're talking about our indigenous culture here in Australia before the arrival of uh, Captain Arthur Phillips. Uh, and this sort of began the, what is formally called the invasion. But Australia was invaded by uh, our Aborigines many years before centuries before. In fact, that, you know, uh, in those times, they uh, developed certain ways of living in this land. And we know that we have a limited lifespan. Therefore, the role of adults uh, male and female, the role of children becomes, you know, becomes important. How we deal with each other. So let's have a look now at the stone tools before the invasion. When then, you know, Captain Arthur Philip they had the muskets. They had, uh, they have the stronger, stronger tools, if you like, to overcome a perceived enemy. And in this case, it was the indigenous people who will live here because they came to settle. 
but initially they also made some deals. I'll give you, you know, 10 bottles. Will you give me a welcome, Angela? Uh, I had problems this morning with <laughs> here, but anyway, I'm, I'm just starting Indigenous um, culture uh, in, uh, you know, pre-invasion times. We're talking about uh, 17, before 1788, basically. Because when Captain Cook came in 1770, uh, he didn't stay. He just came and went. But, he, you know, he brought back uh, the, the information on which then uh, the government of Britain uh, sort of, you know, used to send Captain Arthur Phillips to Australia with the, the prisoners and the guards, etc. And the rest is history, as they say. So stone tools. The Aboriginal people used stone tools in most of their everyday tasks. Many of the jobs of chopping, hammering, scraping, grinding and cutting were done with a stone tool of some type. So was but butchering game, grinding ochre, Right? So is butchering game, grinding ochre, clay paint, grinding seeds into flour and making other tools from wood. The simplest and most commonly used stone tools were often just pieces of stone which happened to be the right shape to do the job. After they were used, they were tossed aside, but it was better to work the stone to shape it and sharpen it. These, there were two kinds of tools used in worked stone. So you could get the natural one from the earth, but you could also then get one and work on it and create it yourself. Called the core tools were pieces of rock that had been packed, ground, chipped or flaked. The, the edge ground axe was made this way. A carefully chosen rock was ground against a harder rock, with sand being used as an abrasive. The finished edge was much sharper than a flaked edge and less likely to shatter. So you have to study even how to create a tool. Again, it shows intelligence on, on the human side. Flaked tools, flaked tools were made by striking sharp pieces from cores. These flakes might then be chipped or flaked into other shapes with a hammer stone. Then the edge was retouched to get it sharp. Spearheads were made by chipping at a flake stone with a pointed piece of bone or wood. Very detailed how they work the, the, the tools. The best stone for tools should break cleanly when struck. It should be free of cracks and flaws. Not all areas were rich in good tool stone, and so a tribe who had it could trade stone for other things that they needed. So if they didn't, you know, other people didn't have these, then they say, I'll give you mine, but you give me some of yours. Quarries were dug to get out the very good stone. So they weren't stupid. They dug quarries. One important stone tool was the axe. The axe. The grand stone axe of Victoria were most carefully made. One important stone was the axe. The grandstone axes of Victoria were most carefully made. Many of them came from a quarry on Mount William in the Great Dividing Range near Lensfield, here in Victoria. Well, the people who owned this quarry traded axes, axe stones over a wide area. Those who got them by trade finished them by rubbing them against another stone until the edge was thin and sharp. They could be used in the hand, but usually they were fastened to wooden handles with guns, with gum and bound right with animal sinews. Gum. Oh, the gum. Yeah, ordinary gum from trees, I suppose. 
these axes could be of various sizes. The large ones were used for felling trees, the smaller ones for trimming pieces of wood into shape. If an axe was chipped in, the use, in use, the owner had to sharpen it again. They didn't throw it away, they just sharpened it again. In this way, the axe got smaller and smaller until a new stone had to be obtained. So you start big and you go small. Interesting. There's some pictures here of, uh, you know, people using stone, stone tools. The knife is one of the most important tools of mankind. In, so the knife is one of the most important tools. Abor Aborigines did not use metal, and so their knives were made from stone. Each man carried a knife, either in a bag or in his air string belt. The stone blade was carefully chipped with another harder stone to make a serrated edge like that on a bread knife, as sometimes the edge was sharpened by grinding. The size of the knives ranged from a few centimetres to 20 centimetres. <laughs> Crocodile down there. This is a knife. This is a knife, right? <laughs> the size of the knives ranged from a few centimetres to 20 centimetres. Aborigines in Central Australia had stone knives with spinifex gum handles and kept them in a paper bark sheath. In northern Queensland, shark's teeth set in wooden handles were used and in southern Western Australia, the blades were small, thin, stone flakes. So that's enough for today, I think, on stones. Not bad, huh? Should I show you some of the pictures here? I'll show you some. I'll show you the pictures here. Yeah, that's one, yeah, working on the stone. And this one here, that's a little cave. Somebody's working there. But this one you can see better, the use of the axe. And then, that's the knife. That's the knife. Looks like the one the crocodile Dundee used. Okay, so that's that. Now, that was before the invasion. Now we have Banjo Patterson, our dear friend. I love him. Uh, the Old Australian Way. This is a, a poem by Banjo Patterson. The Old Australian Ways. The London lights are far abeam behind a bank of cloud. Along the shore the gas lights gleam, the gale is piping loud. And down the channel, groping blind, we drive her through the haze towards the land we left behind, the good old land of never mind and old Australian ways. Never mind, huh? The land of never mind. Never mind, don't worry about it. The narrow ways of English folk are not for such as we. They bear the long accustomed yoke of staid conservancy. But all our roads are new and strange, and through our blood there runs the vagabonding love of change that drove us westward of the range and westward of the suns. That's why we love to travel, because we, we like, you know, to change. We want to be vagabonds. The city folk go to and fro behind a prison's bars. They never feel the breezes blow and never see the stars. They never see the stars. They never hear in blossomed trees the music low and sweet of wild birds making melodies nor catch the little laughing breeze that whispers in the wheat. Beautiful. You know, you can visualise all this. Our fathers came of roving stock. They could not fix the bide. They could not fix the bide. Well, and we have followed field and flock 
Since Eva, we learned to ride. So our fathers came of rowing stock that could not fix the bide, and we have followed field and flock since ever we learned to ride by miner's camp and shearing shed in land of heat and drought. Shed is typically a we followed. Sorry. We followed where our fortunes led, with fortunes always on ahead. And always further out. The wind is in the barley grass, the wattles are in bloom. The breezes greet us as they pass with honey sweet perfume. The parakeets go screaming by with flash of golden wing, and from the swamp the wild ducks cry their long drawn note of revelry, rejoicing at the spring. Uh, we don't see any of this, do we? In today's world in the city, the wind is the barley grass, the wattles are in bloom. We see the wattles, the breezes greet us as they pass with honey sweet perfume. Sometimes we do. The parakeets, that's the birds, etc. So throw the weary pen aside and let the papers rest. That's good advice to me. For we must settle up and ride towards the blue hill's breast. And we must travel far and fast across the rugged maze to find the spring of youth at last and call from the buried past the old Australian ways. So get rid of everything, you know. When people say, I want to go around Australia with a... That's great. That's, that's the Australian spirit. When Clancy took the drover's track in years of long ago, he drifted to the outback, to the outer back, beyond the overflow. By rolling plain and rocky shelf, with stock whip in his hand, he reached at last, O oh lucky elf, the town of come and help yourself in rough and ready land. <laughs> so you want something, come and get it. Nobody's going to pick it up for you. And if it be that you would know the tracks he used to ride, then you must settle up and go beyond the Queensland side, beyond the reach of rule or law, or law to ride the long day through in nature's homestead filled with awe. Yeah, you then might see that Clancy saw and know what Clancy knew. Clancy of the overflow. Have I read that? I think I have. I have to check. But anyway, the thing is with Benjo Patterson is, you know, if you get a book by Benjo Patterson, it's good. Go to the library, or check it out. I don't have many. Uh, I'll have to look uh, at thinsenia.com whether I've got Patterson's books. Uh, maybe it's a good idea today. Uh, full of good ideas today, but uh, my you know, my techniques have uh, somewhat gone bad for some reason. I don't know why today, but I wanted to try something else today, which is, which is, let me see, here. It's called, you know, I want to go to the, uh, to the songs. And this one here is called In Via dei Ciclamini. But, but, let me see. I'm going to play it here and sing it along with none other than Orietta Berti. <laughs> this is another experiment, Angela and uh, Francis, experimenting. And let, let me know whether you like it or not. Here, here we go. In Via dei Ciclamini. Ciclamini al 123 Vendevano le bambole vestite come me La guerra era finita ma però ricordo che sui muri delle bambole scrivevo insieme a te l'amore come leggera s'attacca dove vuole quel giorno senza dirmelo mi ha presa con un fiore l'amore come leggera s'attacca dove vuole non vedo più le bambole ma sono legato a te erano giorni tutti per me erano giorni tutti per te dei ciclamini dove abitavi tu, il muro delle bambole adesso non c'è più, 
hanno messo una balena e l'ascensore va su e giù e cambiano ogni sera le bamboline blu l'amore è come vedere si attacca dove vuole quel giorno senza dirmelo mi ha presa con un fiore l'amore è come l'edera si attacca dove vuole non vedo più le bambole ma sono legato a te erano giorni tutti per me erano giorni tutti per te Via dei ciclamini l'amore si fermò, mi disse ciao bambina, un giorno tornerò. La guerra era finita ma però ricordo che mi disse ciao bambina, ho amato solo te. Come l'edera, attacca dove vuole, quel giorno senza dirmelo, mi ha presa con un fiore, l'amore come l'edera, si attacca dove vuole, non vedo più le bambole, ma sono legato a te, erano giorni, giorni tutti per me. Thank you, Angela, for putting very good. Uh, so you like that, huh? Now, what about if I find another one? Let me see if I can, if I can do this. It's just unbelievable what the, the whole thing uh, improves now. Uh, what about, um, uh, have I got Ivo Zanicki? Testarda, yeah. Yeah, we'll do. Testarda, you will get, uh, let's see if I can get uh, Testarda, yeah. Let's see. Let's see. It's coming. Don't worry. Uh, come on. <laughs> I don't believe this. When you're looking for it, they start there. Here we go. This revolutionary new device. No, no, no. No, we don't want that. We don't want the ad. Go on. Che ti dico sempre sì, testarda io che ti sento più di così, intanto porto i segni dentro me per le tue strane follie, per la mia gelosia. La mia solitudine sei tu, la mia rabbia vera sei sempre tu, ma non mi chiedere perché, se a testa bassa vado via per ripicca senza te. <coughs> Io per orgoglio io ti salverei Dei tuoi miti cosa ne farei Intanto porto i segni dentro me Di un amore che oramai vive solo senza me Mia solitudine sei tu, la mia rabbia vera sei sempre tu, ora non mi chiedere perché, se a testa bassa vado via per ripicca senza te. Tima. Ah, even the applause. Well, that. I'm getting an applause as well. <laughs> it's unbelievable. How do we do it, Tom? Oh, that's incredible. So that's how you can learn Italian songs. You play them, uh, you play them, you know, online and you can sing along. That's how you do it. Ti manderei all'inferno questo sì 
testarda io che ti sento più di così intanto porto i segni dentro me per la tua eredità per la mia fatalità la mia solitudine sei tu la mia rabbia vera sei sempre tu ora non mi chiedere perché se a testa bassa vado via per ripicca senza te la mia solitudine sei tu l'unico mi appiglio ancora tu ora non mi chiedere perché se a testa bassa vado via per ripicca senza te uh, I love the applause uh, there you are well we're almost time now I, I, I have to admit you know this is a good experiment I'll work on it a little bit more it's good now uh, I wanted to do one uh, with Orietta Berta, but it's not, not, not enough time. Uh, and what I will do, uh, I just want to talk about now a few things that are coming up uh, with me. Tomorrow I've got the French and Spanish lesson. It's going to be interesting too because, um, you know, with all this experimentation that I'm doing, uh, the programs will be uh, improved. But tomorrow is French and Spanish only half an hour from 11.25 uh, to, to 12. If you have the book, La, La Fa, Les Femmes Parlent Trop, don't forget to have it in front of you when I'm doing it. And Angela, I know, has got one. So that's good. Francis, you get one too. Uh, anyone who comes to me, I can uh, oblige. Okay? <laughs> one way or another. All right, that's, that's one. On Sunday, we do Dante Alighieri at 11.25 to 12.30. Canto 25. Yes, Canto 25 is the second part of Iladri, which is interesting. And then, of course, on Tuesday, the Italian class. And next Thursday, I'll continue with Africa. But I want now some people interaction. I need their interaction with people. And I'm inviting you and anyone else who listens to me after this, to come to Federazione Lugana on su Sunday, the 20th of March, at 3.30pm, uh, I'll uh, start, so you can be there a little, five minutes earlier, to, to five o'clock. They, they're open uh, earlier, but uh, I'll, I'll be there at quarter past, and I'll prepare myself and meet up whoever comes to me. Now, what is the advantage of doing that? Is we get to know each other. You can learn. If you have uh, you know, problems with technology, we can discuss those. We can build up even a chorus of people who, who want to sing along together. If you don't feel like it, and I'll give you the words. I'll you know, copy them or whatever. Uh, but, you know, you'll, you'll do what I'm doing now. You'll, you'll be learning and discovering what you can do yourself. Because if you do that, you gain in skills, you gain in knowledge. But then there's that, the human factor too. You get to know each other a bit well, a bit better as well. So uh, I hope I haven't done all this. Uh, I've done it for me primarily, but with you in mind. I always have other people in mind when I do anything. And, um, yep. And, you know, I'm not afraid of making mistakes. I admit to them. Uh, but so what? You know, at the end of the day, as long as you do the right thing in general, you, uh, you're okay. You don't hurt people. That's the main thing. You try to help. 
and if the other person doesn't want it, it doesn't matter. But, you know, you never hear me criticising anyone doing anything that they're doing. It's, uh, it, it's important to me that other people have a similar respect. And on that note, I hope that um, this particular live show will go on. I'm going to point to the finish line now. And uh, ciao from Tom Padula, Tom Padula TV on YouTube and Insania Booksellers. And don't forget, books are important. Get some. And from me, preferably. Ciao.